Over the past 60 years, cosmology has become ever more precise in its ability to account for the best available data about the universe. Many discoveries throughout our history have enabled us to better understand the universe around us. Even though we don't know everything, there are enormous sources of knowledge that have empowered us to draw far-reaching conclusions about our universe. We know what it's made up of in terms of matter, energy, radiation, and so on. We know that there are 400 billion within our galaxy and about 2 trillion galaxies are present throughout the visible universe. We know how the universe clumps and clusters together into galaxy groups, clusters and filaments, and how they're separated by vast cosmic voids. We know the scale of the cosmic distances defining these structures and how the universe is evolving over time. It's a remarkable story that all fits together beautifully in the framework of the Big Bang and general relativity theory. But along the way, experts have had to postulate the universe was not built for the human mind to understand. Up to now, all the stars, planets, and galaxies that can be seen today make up just 5% of the universe. The other 95% is made of stuff astronomers can't see, can't detect, or even comprehend. Worse, when we extrapolate back to the earliest stages of the universe and compare what we expect to observe, there are some big problems. Not long after the James Webb Space Telescope, or JWST, began beaming back from outer space its stunning images of planets and nebula last year, astronomers, though dazzled, had to admit that something was amiss. Eight months later, based in part on what the telescope has revealed, it's beginning to look as if we may need to rethink key features of the origin and development of the universe. Join us today as we dig deep into how the James Webb Space Telescope has debunked all modern theories of the universe. The James Webb Space Telescope is a breathtakingly glorious feat of engineering. Built on the Hubble Space Telescope's discoveries, James Webb is a giant leap forward in our quest to understand the universe and our origins. It is a premier observatory with a large infrared telescope that has an approximately 6.5 meter primary mirror. The most cutting edge engineering allowed Webb to examine every phase of cosmic history, from the first luminous glows after the Big Bang, to the formation of galaxies, stars and planets, to the evolution of our own solar system. Launched at the end of 2021, as a joint project of NASA, the European Space Agency and the Canadian Space Agency, the Webb, a tool with unmatched powers of observation, is on an exciting mission to look back in time at the first stars and galaxies, delivering and giving us a broader understanding of the origins of our universe. But the fact that the more curious we get about the great cosmic unknowns, the more unanswered questions our investigations of the universe will reveal. And the same is also true for James Webb. Indeed, one of Webb's first major findings was exciting in an uncomfortable sense. It discovered the existence of fully formed galaxies far earlier than should have been possible, according to the so-called standard model of cosmology. According to the standard model, which is the basis for essentially all research in the field, there is a fixed and precise sequence of events that followed the Big Bang. First, the force of gravity pulled together denser regions in the cooling cosmic gas, which grew to become stars and black holes. Then, the force of gravity pulled together the stars into galaxies. The web data, though, revealed that some very large galaxies formed really fast in too short a time, at least according to the standard model. This was no minor discrepancy. The finding is akin to parents and their children appearing in a story when the grandparents are still children themselves. Unfortunately, it was not an isolated incident. There have been other recent occasions in which the evidence behind science's basic understanding of the universe has been found to be alarmingly inconsistent. Take the matter of how fast the universe is expanding. This is a fundamental fact in cosmological science, the so-called Hubble constant, yet 
scientists have not been able to settle on a number. There are two main ways to calculate it. One involves measurements of the early universe, such as the sort that the web is providing. The other involves measurements of nearby stars in the modern universe. Despite decades of effort, these two methods continue to yield different answers. At first, scientists expected this discrepancy to resolve as the data got better, but the problem has stubbornly persisted even as the data have gotten far more precise. And now, new data from the web have exacerbated the problem. This trend suggests a flaw in the model, not in the data. Two serious issues with the standard model of cosmology would be concerning enough, but the model has already been patched up numerous times over the past half century to better conform with the best available data. Alterations that may well be necessary and correct, but which, in light of the problems we are now confronting, could strike a skeptic as a bit too convenient. Physicists and astronomers are starting to get the sense that something may be really wrong. It's not just that some of us believe we might have to rethink the standard model of cosmology. We might also have to change the way we think about some of the most basic features of our universe. A conceptual revolution, if you will, that would have implications far beyond the world of science. A potent mix of hard-won data and rare-field abstract mathematical physics, the standard model of cosmology is rightfully understood as a triumph of human ingenuity. It has its origins in the Edwin Hubble's discovery in the 1920s that the universe was expanding, the first piece of evidence for the Big Bang. Then in 1964, radio astronomers discovered the so-called cosmic microwave background, the fossil radiation reaching us from shortly after the universe began expanding. That finding told us that the early universe was a hot, dense soup of subatomic particles that has been continually cooling and becoming less dense ever since. Over the past 60 years, cosmology has become ever more precise in its ability to account for the best available data about the universe. But along the way, to gain such a high degree of precision, astrophysicists have had to postulate the existence of components of the universe for which we have no direct evidence. The standard model today holds that normal matter, the stuff that makes up people and planets and everything else we can see, constitutes only about 4% of the universe. The rest is invisible stuff called dark matter and dark energy roughly 28% and 68% respectively. Cosmic inflation is an example of yet another exotic adjustment made to the standard model. Devised in 1981 to resolve paradoxes arising from an older version of the Big Bang, the theory holds that the early universe expanded exponentially fast for a fraction of a second after the Big Bang. This theory solves certain problems but creates others. Notably, according to most versions of the theory, rather than there being one universe, ours is just one universe in a multi-universe, an infinite number of universes, the others of which may be forever unobservable to us, not just in practice, but also in principle. There's nothing inherently fishy about these features of the standard model. Scientists often discover good indirect evidence for things that we cannot see, such as hyperdense singularities inside a black hole, but in the wake of Webb's confounding data about galaxy formation and the worsening problem with the Hubble constant, you can't be blamed for starting to wonder if the model is out of joint. A familiar narrative about how science works is often trotted out at this point to assuage anxieties. It goes like this. Researchers think that they have a successful theory but new data show it is flawed. Courageously rolling up their sleeves, the scientists go back to the blackboards and come up with new ideas that allow them to improve their theory by better matching the evidence. It's a story of both humility and triumph, and scientists love to tell it. And it may be what happens in this case too. Perhaps the solution to the problems the web is forcing us to confront will require only that cosmologists come up with a new dark something or 
other, that will allow our picture of the universe to continue to match the best cosmological data. However, there is another possibility. We may be at the point where we need a radical departure from the standard model, one that may even require us to change how we think of the elemental components of the universe, possibly even the nature of space and time itself. Cosmology is not like other sciences. It's not like studying mice in a maze or watching chemicals boil in a beaker in a lab. The universe is everything there is. There's only one, and, and we can't look at it from the outside. You can't put it in a box on a table and run controlled experiments on it. Because it is all-encompassing, cosmology forces scientists to tackle questions about the very environment in which science operates. The nature of time, the nature of space, the nature of law-like regularity, the role of the observers doing the observations. These rarefied issues don't come up in the most regular science, though one encounters similarly shadowy issues in the science of consciousness and in quantum physics. But working so close to the boundary between science and philosophy, cosmologists are continually haunted by the ghosts of basic assumptions hiding unseen in the tools we use, such as the assumption that scientific laws don't change over time. But that's precisely the sort of assumption we might have to start questioning in order to figure out what's wrong with the standard model. One possibility, raised by the physicist Lee Smolin and the philosopher Roberto Mangambera Unger, is that the laws of physics can evolve and change over time. Different laws might even compete for effectiveness. An even more radical possibility, discussed by the physicist John Wheeler, is that every act of observation influences the future and even the past history of the universe. Dr. Wheeler, working to understand the paradoxes of quantum mechanics, conceived of the participatory universe, in which every act of observation was in some sense a new act of creation. It is not obvious, to say the least, how such revolutionary reconsiderations of our science might help us better understand the cosmological data that is flamoxing us. Part of the difficulty is that the data themselves are shaped by the theoretical assumptions of those who collect them. It would necessarily be a leap of faith to step back and rethink such fundamentals about our science. But a revolution may end up being the best path to progress. That has certainly been the case in the past, with scientific breakthroughs like Copernicus's heliocentrism, or Darwin's theory of evolution and Einstein's relativity. All three of those theories ended up having enormous cultural influence, threatening our sense of our special place in the cosmos, challenging our intuition that we were fundamentally different than other animals, upending our faith in common sense ideas about the flow of time, any scientific revolution of the sort we're imagining would presumably have comparable reverberations in our understanding of ourselves. The philosopher Robert Creese has written that philosophy is what's required when doing more science may not answer a scientific question. It's not clear yet if that's what's needed to overcome the crisis in cosmology, but if more tweaks and adjustments don't do the trick, we may need not just a new story of the universe, but also a new way to tell stories about it. But noting that despite the universe itself may be finite or may be infinite, the part that's accessible to us is finite. Even with the expanding universe, even with all the galaxies and stars and planet and molecules and atoms and subatomic particles in it, there's only so much we can assess. And those limitations, the total number of particles and the total amount of energy available in the universe means there's only a finite amount of information we can determine about our cosmos. The total amount of information accessible to us in the universe is finite, and hence, so is the amount of knowledge we can gain about it. There's a limit to the amount of energy we can access, the particles we can observe, and the measurements we can make. That doesn't mean we're done, or that we shouldn't strive to learn everything we absolutely can. Only we can push the frontiers of knowledge back as far as they can go. 
There's a whole lot left to learn, and a whole lot of science that is yet to be revealed. If we continue to look, maybe the present unknowns will likely fall in the near future. But what is knowable is finite, and this implies that there are necessarily some things we may never know. The universe may yet be infinite, but our knowledge of it will never be. Regardless, the James Webb Space Telescope's upcoming discoveries are still worth looking forward to. The JWST has completed successfully its first year of scientific operation in the vacuum of space from its location nearly 1.5 million kilometers away from Earth. In addition to taking the most detailed and breathtaking images ever of the iconic celestial objects, Webb completed its first deep field campaign, turned its infrared optics on Mars and Jupiter, obtained spectra directly from an exoplanet's atmosphere, blocked out the light of a star to reveal the debris disk orbiting it, detected its first exoplanet, and spotted some of the earliest galaxies in the universe those that existed at the cosmic dawn. Now, as the James Webb Space Telescope enters its second year of capturing images of the depths of space, it has already revealed a treasure trove of beauty from around the universe, both near and far from home. A major focus of the Webb mission is the investigation of Cosmic Dawn, which began roughly one billion years after the Big Bang. Also known as the Epoch of Reionization, this period is so named because the first galaxies emerged during this time. This led to the reionization of the neutral hydrogen that permeated the intergalactic medium, or IgM, causing the universe to be transparent. This era is considered the final frontier of cosmological surveys because the extreme redshift and presence of neutral hydrogen make it impossible to study this period in visible light. The lack of transparency during this period led to it being nicknamed the Cosmic Dark Ages. The only way to detect light from this period is by observing the 21 centimeter transition line, a part of the ratio spectrum inaccessible to modern day instruments, or the H-alpha emission line, which is visible in the mid-infrared spectrum. According to a recent study, an international team led by the Capitan Astronomical Institute, or CHI, resolved the H-alpha emission line using data from the Webb's MIRI instrument, thus providing the first confirmed detection of galaxies at cosmic dawn. During cycle two, astronomers intend to push the boundaries even farther. For starters, Pi Carl Glazebrook of the Swinburne University of Technology and an international team were allotted 615 hours to conduct a JWST-wide Area 3D Parallel Survey. This will consist of pure parallel observations using JWST's Near Infrared Imager and Slitless Spectrograph, or near -ISIS, of an area covering a thousand square arc minutes. The resulting survey, they claim, will provide spectra and redshift measurements for 60,000 galaxies from cosmic noon to cosmic dawn, circa 10 to 11 billion to 13 billion years ago, from the first stars and galaxies to the birth of the second generation of stars, or population two stars. Such a large area redshift survey will allow us to measure 3D clustering in the cosmic growth era, revealing the detailed connection between dark matter halos and assembling baryons. It will also provide a benchmark set of stellar mass functions for complete spectroscopic type defined samples, address the origin of galactic quenching, provide 2D abundance and age measurements of galaxies measuring galactic buildup, and provide a census of rare Z greater than 11 bright galaxies and other rare objects at all redshifts. The size of the survey will also enable data-driven discovery with advanced machine learning approaches revealing novelties and surprises in the early universe, Carl Glazebrook and his research team said. In addition, Pi Hakim Attic of the Institute of Astrophysics at Paris and his colleagues proposed the gravitational lensing and near-cam imaging to probe the early galaxy formation and sources of reionization 
or glimpse they call it, observation campaign. By taking ultra-deep images with Webb's near-infrared camera, the NearCam, ATEC and his team will observe low-mass galaxies a few hundred million years after the Big Bang. During their 148 hours of observation, they hope to investigate the mechanisms governing galaxy formation, such as gas accretion, star formation, and the subsequent feedback inhibiting further star formation. This, they claim, will achieve three main goals. We propose, they say, to combine the power of strong gravitational lensing with ultra-deep near-cam imaging to achieve these three main goals. Number one, to measure the prevalence of faint galaxies at a Z greater than six to establish, for the first time, key observational benchmarks for galaxy formation models, which have never been confronted to this uncharted territory. Secondly, strongly constrain the contribution of the faintest galaxies towards cosmic reionization. And thirdly, probe the typical galaxy population during the Dark Ages that remains out of reach of current programs. Professor Daniel Einstein of Harvard University and an international team were awarded 137.1 hours for their proposal, unveiling the redshift frontier with JWST. This will consist of a deep six-filter medium band imaging survey with a near cam to identify galaxies at the redshift frontier Z equals greater than 15. The properties of these very early galaxies will test and inform theories of galaxy formation and allow astronomers to make discoveries about the physics of the early universe. This includes theories about the possible presence of early dark energy to explain the discrepancy between measurements of cosmic expansion, aka the Hubble tension. They also plan to conduct this survey parallel to a deep multi-object spectroscopy campaign conducted with NearSpec of galaxy candidates in and around the Hubble Ultra Deep Field, or HUDF. These spectra will provide detailed information about individual high redshift galaxies, not just stacks or averages, allowing us to study the chemical enrichment, stellar populations, star formation histories, and nuclear black holes in the first billion years of the universe, they state. In addition, one of the most anticipated aspects of the Webb mission is how it will assist with the transition currently taking place in exoplanet science. Whereas astronomers were largely focused on the discovery process in the past, improved instruments, methods, and analytics are shifting the focus towards characterization. To date, the vast majority of exoplanets have been detected by indirect means, which meant that constraints on their habitability had to be inferred based on their parent star, the distance at which they orbited, and their respective masses. But thanks to Webb's superior infrared optics and sensitivity, astronomers look forward to being able to directly image exoplanets and obtain spectra from their atmospheres. In particular, they hope to direct Webb's mirrors toward nearby M-type or red dwarf stars and their rocky planets, many of which have been confirmed in recent years. In addition to being the most common stars in the universe, accounting for about 75 to 80 percent, red dwarfs are also likely to support rocky planets within their habitable zones, or HZs. However, these planets are likely to be tidally locked with their suns, and red dwarfs are prone to flare activity, which raises questions about their long-term ability to retain atmospheres. To address this mystery, Dr. Shubham Kanodia of the Carnegie Institution of Washington and his team were awarded 132.39 hours for their program titled Red Dwarfs and the Seven Giants. This sweetly named study will characterize the atmospheres of giant rocky planets around M-type stars to address one of the JWST's primary science goals, how atmospheric composition can affect a planet's formation and evolutionary history. This will consist of Kenodia and his team using Webb's near-infrared spectrometer, or near-spec, to observe short-period Jupiter-sized planets around red dwarfs, which pose challenges to current theories about planet formation and represent an extreme regime that is poorly understood. 
By comparing the atmospheres of seven M dwarf short period Jupiters to the gas giants that orbit our Sun, they hope to characterize their atmospheric composition and metallicity and compare them to gas giants that orbit more massive yellow type or F type Sun like or G type and orange dwarf K type stars. Well, that's all the information we have for you today. Don't forget to give us a thumbs up if you enjoyed today's episode, subscribe if you haven't already, and hit that bell so you never miss out on future episodes. And be sure to tell us what you think about today's content. Everyone's support motivates us to continue delivering quality content like this and to always improve. And as always, thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.